Hi, and welcome back to our conversation on the immune system. This is our fourth video in the series. In this video, we're gonna be focusing specifically on the process of antigen presentation, which is the way in which our innate immune cells are able to interact and activate the adaptive immune system. Picking up where our story left off last time with the innate immune system sort of treating the initial stages of the battle and the dendritic cell heading towards the lymph node where it was going to use antigen presentation to activate the adaptive immune system. So stay tuned while we take the next step in our journey to understanding the immune system. Hi, and thanks for tuning in again to our conversation about the immune system. Today, we're continuing that conversation by talking about antigen presentation, which is the process by which our innate immune cells are able to interact with our adaptive immune system to either activate or to continue an immune response. Now, in order to talk about antigen presentation, we first have to take a small step back to talk about something that we spoke about earlier in much greater detail. If you remember my conversation about the innate immune cells, we talked about how our innate immune cells, uh, and actually as we'll find out, all of our cells, have a receptor on the surface called a major histocompatibility complex. We abbreviate that MHC. In order to understand antigen presentation, we first must understand what MHCs are and what they do. So MHCs come in three different classes, class one, class two, and class three MHCs. Sometimes we refer to them as MHC1, MHC2, or MHC3. Now, for the purposes of this video and today's conversation, we're going to ignore MHC3s, and we're just gonna focus on MHC1s and MHC2s. So class one MHCs are found on the surface of all nucleated cells. And by that, I mean pretty much every cell in your body that isn't a red blood cell. Now, what major histocompatibility complexes are, uh, are designed to do is they are receptors that help to tell the outside world what is going on inside of that given cell. So remember, you've got this, in th this elaborate immune system, and one of the things that it needs to be able to do is to sort of understand what's happening in your body at all times. And it needs to be able to, at least some cells in your immune system, have to have the ability to see what's going on in all of your cells to make sure that they're healthy and that they're normal and that they're okay. Well, it can't pick up the phone and call them and it doesn't have any windows in it to look into. So what your cells do with these MHC1 displays is sort of display to the outside world exactly what's going on. And they do this uh, through a process called uh, MHC display. So major histocompatibility complex proteins are produced within the cell. And then in the process of after being produced, they actually get loaded with small pieces of proteins called peptides that your body produces. Once loaded, these receptors are trafficked to the plasma membrane, insert themselves in the plasma membrane, and then sort of dangle out these little pieces of protein produced by that cell into the extracellular space. You can think of them as little tiny billboards that are displaying exactly what's going on in the cell. Hey, this is what I'm making today. Now, this is very, very important for your, innate, or for your adaptive immune system. In particular, it's important for a group of adaptive immune cells called cytotoxic T cells or killer T cells. And remember, your killer T cells are the type of lymphocyte whose job it is is to, to attack virally infected cells and convince them to kill themselves through apoptosis. Well, what happens then is a, as a killer T cell is able to come up and interview any one of your cells by simply looking at the surface at those MHC1 displays and seeing if its specialized T cell receptor is able to recognize its cognate antigen on the surface of that cell. If it does recognize that cognate antigen, it can be fairly safe to assume that that particular, that particular cell is infected in some way and then ask it to kill itself. But if we think about this, uh, this, this whole situation actually begs a few questions. So for example, how does, a nat how does a killer T cell know that that cell is infected with a virus and not, in, and not recognizing some type of self antigen and making a perfectly healthy and normal cell destroy itself? Well, the answer is simple. Remember our conversation about T cells. Remember that we are not allowed to have T cells that produce T cell receptors that recognize self antigen. 
If a cell is normal and healthy and not infected with a virus, the type of antigen it's going to be producing is self-antigen. And since all of those T-cell clones that have T-cell receptors that recognize self-antigen were eliminated during the immune tolerance process, it's fairly safe to assume that you don't have any killer T-cells that would tell a normal, healthy cell producing its own antigen to destroy itself. The second question then would be, well, when would a cell begin producing proteins that aren't their own? Well, the answer is also fairly simple. When a virus hijacks it. So a virus, when, upon hijacking a host cell, is going to convince that host cell to stop doing its own stuff and start making viral stuff. Remember, viruses hijack your cells and turn them into virus-producing machines. Well, as part of producing uh, new viruses, it's going to have to produce viral proteins. And when they make their MHC1s, they're going to be packing some of those viral peptides into their MHC1s. And as they traffic to the membrane, they'll begin dangling viral protein outside of the plasma membrane. And that's what those killer T cells might pick up on. Okay, well, if that's the case, how did those killer T cells actually get activated in the first place so that they could go to the tissue in order to recognize these virally infected cells? Well, that's the job of the dendritic cell. Okay, well, how then did the dendritic cell actually alert these killer T cells and get them activated so that they could go to the tissue and convince uh, virally infected cells to kill themselves? Great question. And I'm going to tell you, hold that thought. So let's back up and let's talk about class 2 MHCs or MHC2s. Class 2 MHCs are not found on the surface of all cells. In fact, they're really only found on a group of cells known as antigen presenting cells. And for the most part, the APCs or antigen presenting cells in your body are dendritic cells, macrophages, and activated B cells. Now, all three of these cells have the ability to present antigen to various other cells in your immune system. That being said, they don't all do it in the same way, they don't all do it in the same place, and they don't all do it for the same reasons. We will, during this broad conversation about the immune system, talk about how all three of these are involved in antigen presentation and why they present antigen and where and when. But today we're gonna to focus specifically on one of these APCs, the dendritic cell. So dendritic cells are the professional antigen producing cell in your body. In fact, they are the only antigen producing cell in your body that is able to activate naive T cells. Now, as I mentioned, MHC1s are there for the purpose of killer T cells. MHC2s, on the other hand, that information is of interest to helper T cells or TH cells. So MHC2s are slightly different than MHC1s. If you recall, class 1 MHCs are designed in order to display what that particular cell is making to the outside world. On the other hand, class 2 MHCs are designed to show the world what that cell has eaten. And that's the major difference, because MHC2 receptors are loaded with material that has been phagocytosed by the particular cell in which it is found. So what happens with the dendritic cell while it's at the scene of that battle that we spoke about in the last video? It's collecting all of this battlefield material. And then upon ingesting it, it's being sorted out and packaged into newly created MHC2 receptors. So remember, at the end of our last video, we talked about how that dendritic cell had been on the battle scene for six or seven hours. It's now hopped into that lymphatic vessel. And it's now on its way to the secondary lymph organ, most likely a lymph node. So, once it, so on the way to that lymphoid organ, on the way to that lymph node, it's not just going to sit there and twiddle its thumbs. Instead, it's going to be processing all of that battlefield antigen that it collected. It's going to package it into MHC2 receptors on its surface. And the way I like to think about it is by the time that this dendritic cell shows up in the lymph node, it's going to be bedazzled head to toe in all of that foreign material that it's collected at the battle scene. And this is going to be very, very important for what the dendritic cell is about to do next. Because what that dendritic cell is going to do is it's going to show up in the lymph node. And it's going to arrive essentially at a T-cell party. And all of these T-cells are going to be very interested uh, at what's on the surface of that dendritic cell. And the process of antigen presentation is the way in which this dendritic cell is actually going to activate some of those T-cells. What I want to talk about now is a scenario in which we have a bacterial infection. The process is the same in most cases, depending on what the pathogen is, but there are some subtle differences if it's a viral infection, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So let's picture this dendritic cell at the scene of a bacterial infection. 
at the battle scene, there are going to be all kinds of, of, of destruction happening. You're going to have complements forming max. You're going to have macrophages, phagocytosing some of these bacteria, and essentially exocytosing little chunks of that particular bacteria that it's been chewing up. You're going to have all kinds of battlefield material running around, all those pamps, right? The dendritic cell is going to collect all that. It's going to package it into its class 2 MHC receptors on its surface and begin displaying them. So when it arrives in the lymph node, its MHC2 displays are going to be fully packed with all of this bacterial battlefield antigen that provides evidence of what particular infection is going on. Now, what's going to happen is that dendritic cell is then going to wander through that lymph node. It's going to interview with as many of those T cells as it possibly can, asking one simple question. Does your T cell receptor recognize any of the material on the outside of me in my MHC2 display as foreign antigen, as your cognate antigen? Can you recognize it? Because if a T cell does recognize some of that battlefield antigen, it's a T cell that could very, very likely help out and fight this, uh, this current infection. Now, in order to activate naive T cells, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to pretend this is a novel infection. This body has never before been infected by this particular pathogen because activating memory T cells is a lot easier than activating naive T cells. So we're going to do it the hard way. Now, the first thing to recognize is this. In the lymph node, there are going to be naive killer T cells and there are going to be naive helper T cells. We'll focus first on what's going on with the helper T cells. Now, if you recall, helper T cells are, are particularly interested in what a cell displays, particularly an antigen-presenting cell, displays in its class 2 MHCs on the surface. It's interested in what that antigen-presenting cell has eaten. But how does a helper T cell know specifically which MHC it's reading, MHC1 or MHC2? And to understand that, we've got to back up a little bit. If you recall our conversation about how T cells are born and how they mature in the thymus, one of the things you might remember is the process of positive selection. In addition to forming its own unique, wonderful T cell receptor, T cells in the, in the thymus actually have a couple of other co-receptors that are called CD receptors. So when they're born, those T cells are going to have uh, a T cell receptor, but they're also going to have a CD3 co-receptor, which attaches kind of to the base of the T cell receptor, and two other CDs, CD4 and CD8. Now, during that step of positive selection, remember we talked about how those T cells have to interview and see whether or not they can recognize your body's MHCs on the surface of some of your other cells. And the answer needed to be yes, because this is the positive round of selection. Well, if the CD4 on the surface of that cell recognizes an MHC2 receptor on the surface of another cell, well, then that cell's CD8 receptors will no longer be produced. It will produce exclusively CD4 receptors, and it will be a helper T cell. On the other hand, remember killer T cells, they're most interested in the MHC1 displays on the surface of, a, uh, of one of your own cells. If it happens to be that during that positive selection, it's the CD8 co-receptor that recognizes the MHC1 receptor on the surface of the other cell, then it'll stop producing its CD4 receptor and forever forth be known as a killer T cell. See, that's the key to the specificity of, of, of helper T cells and of killer T cells to their respective MHCs. It's these CD co-receptors. So the way I remember this is, uh, is sort of a little math trick. CD4s specifically interact with MHC2s. 4 times 2 is 8. CD8 receptors on killer T cells specifically interact with MHC1 receptors on the surface of their antigen-presenting cells. And I remember this this way. 8 times 1 is 8. So as long as you can multiply the MHC times the CD number and get 8, you've got the right pairing. But that's where that specificity comes from. So if you are a helper T cell, you will have your specialized, unique, wonderful, awesome T cell receptor. You will also have a CD3 co-receptor attached to your base, and that CD3 will be attached to the base of the CD4 receptor in your surface. All of these tools will be necessary for antigen presentation. If you are a killer T cell, you still have your unique, wonderful, awesome T cell receptor that's unique just to you that will be attached at the base to a CD3 co-receptor, which will in turn be attached to a CD8 receptor in the surface and that will allow you to specifically read mhc1 displays in the cells you interact with 
Kind of a cool system, right? It's all protein-protein interactions. And you'll see why these interactions are important in just a second. So how does the antigen presentation take place? Well, the process we're going to talk about is the activation first of a naive helper T cell. So this dendritic cell is wandering around in the tissue. It's interviewing uh, very rapidly with uh, a number of helper T cells. For example, it can interact with a, with a few hundred T cells in, in, in about an hour. Uh, so it's doing this process very quickly. And it's basically wandering up to every one of its helper T cells it can find and say, do you recognize this? Do you recognize this? Do you recognize this? And for the most part, the answer is going to be no. But if it does happen to encounter a helper T cell whose T cell receptor recognizes with some degree of infinity, uh, affinity one of the battlefield antigens it's presenting in its MHC2 display, that reaction will actually persist. Hey, you do recognize something that I have that's bedazzling the outside of my cell. Very cool. Let's talk more. So to activate a naive helper T cell, there are four things needed. That's the first one. The first thing that needs to happen is we have to say, is this the right antigen? And that is conferred by the fact that the T cell receptor will recognize some of the antigen on the surface of that dendritic cell or antigen presenting cell. The next step is this. I've got the right information, but is it from the correct source? Now remember, helper T cells only get information from MHC2 receptors. The main reason is this. Only antigen presenting cells are licensed to activate or to re-stimulate, in some cases, we'll hold that thought, a helper T cell. So it's not just, to, it just enough to say, hey, this is my cognate antigen. Nope, it's got to be presented in an MHC2 display, in a class 2 MHC2 protein. How does this get recognized? Well, that's the next step. The CD4 receptor on the helper T cell has to bind to the MHC2 receptor on the surface. Now, if that cognate antigen is in fact being presented, in an MHC2 receptor on the surface of that antigen presenting cell, then the uh, CD4 receptor will actually clamp on to the MHC2 and draw those cells into a tight, long lasting connection that will allow the next steps to occur. If, on the other hand, that CD4 co receptor does not recognize that that antigen is being presented in an MHC2 receptor, the reaction immediately falls apart. Hey, it's the right information, but it's the wrong source. I'm not allowed to get that information from you. Or perhaps it's the right information, but it's in an MHC1 display. Well, guess what? Helper T cells aren't supposed to be activated by what that cell's making. It's only supposed to be activated by what that cell has eaten. Okay? So step one, right information. That is where the cognate antigen needs to be recognized by the T cell receptor. Step two, that information is coming from the right source. The CD4 receptor recognizes that that antigen is being presented in an MHC2 receptor. It's coming from an antigen presenting cell. The third step is, is it enough information? So you can imagine a scenario in which a helper T cell uh, only recognizes a very small amount of its antigen on the surface of that particular dendritic cell. It's enough where the conversation needs to happen, but if that helper T cell can't find a ton of its antigen on the surface, it's perhaps that helper T cell really isn't the one that we need to be activating at this particular point in time. There might be other helper T cells that are more important for aiding in this particular fight. So the next thing that actually has to happen is as that reaction persists, as that CD4 draws that uh, the, the antigen presenting cell closer, what's going to start happening is more of the T cell receptors are going to begin migrating to that, that that contact zone between the two cells. Remember when I said that there can be as many as 100,000 of that identical T cell receptor found in the plasma membrane of any given helper T cell. Those receptors are now going to start migrating to that connection point between the helper T cell and the dendritic cell. And they're going to also try to find other MHC2s that contain its their cognate antigen. That leads to something that's known as an immunological synapse. So we need this, this synapse to actually form where all of these migrating uh, T cell receptors are binding to many, many copies of that particular battlefield cognate antigen that's going to be needed to activate the cell. So the third step is a question of abundance. Is there enough of my cognate antigen present for, to warrant me being activated? The fourth step is called co-stimulation. And when it comes to co-stimulation, what's going to happen 
is it's going to involve another protein that's on the surface of that antigen presenting cell. When we're talking about a naive helper T cell or a naive T cell or B cell in any way for that matter, those T cell receptors are actually very poorly connected to the nucleus. And remember, if you want a cell to change its behavior, the thing you have to talk to in that cell is the nucleus. That's where, the, that's where all of the information is stored, and that's sort of the control center or the brain of that particular cell. So one of the things that has to happen then is the signals from the membrane have to be relayed to the nucleus to say, hey, uh, a bunch of our T cell receptors are bound, we're activated. It turns out that in naive helper T cells, though, these receptors are pretty poorly pretty poor at communicating this information. So how can we help them? Well, what we can actually do is provide them with a microphone. So without this process of co-stimulation, you would need to have an inordinately, number, an inordinately high number of T-cell receptors activated, which is very, very unlikely in most cases to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this process of co-stimulation that's going to act as a microphone to help relay those signals from the plasma membrane to the nucleus that the cell has been selected for activation. The co-stimulation comes in the form of a protein in the surface of that dendritic cell called the B7 protein. And that B7 protein fits very nicely into a receptor on the surface of the dendritic cell called CD28, another CD receptor. When that fourth step happens, it acts to supercharge that interaction of those, recept of those T cell receptors and then triggers the, the cell to, uh, to, to begin the process of activation. Once that helper T cell is activated, the interaction between the dendritic cell and the T cell is actually going to fall apart. That dendritic cell is going to go on to, in hopes of finding other T cells that it's able to activate. That helper T cell, however, is now going to undergo a process of rapid proliferation. It's actually going to divide over and over again until it can make thousands of copies of itself in as little time as a week. And all of those helper T cell clones will be completely identical in terms of what T cell receptor it has. We'll talk in our next video about where those helper T cells are going to go and what they're going to do when we focus on adaptive immunity. So that's great. Now we've activated our helper T cell branch of the, of the adaptive immune system. So we have helper T cells activated. But what about killer T cells? Why haven't we activated any killer T cells yet? And for that, we need to figure, remind ourselves of what killer T cells jobs are. Killer T cells are our specialized weapons in a viral infection. Why won't this dendritic cell ever activate any of those naive killer T cells? And the answer is fairly simple. This is not a viral infection. When that dendritic cell shows up, it will in fact have antigens presented in its MHC1 receptors. But alas, those, the, that antigen is self-antigen. Remember, this dendritic cell is not infected with anything. It's part of a bacterial infection. What's it producing inside of its own cell? Its own stuff. It's making self-antigen. And again, we shouldn't have any T cells available with T cell receptors that can actually be activated by self-antigen. But let's change it up. What if this were a viral infection? What would be different? Well, uh, it's actually pretty simple. If this were a viral infection and that dendritic cell did show up in the lymph node, would it be presenting viral antigen in its MHC2 receptors? Absolutely, right? Those class 2 MHCs would be packed full of the battlefield antigen, which would include little pieces of viral proteins and so on and so forth that it collected at the battle scene. But what else would happen? Well, that dendritic cell would also likely be infected with that virus. And because it's infected with a virus, one of the things that it's going to do is begin producing viral proteins. Where would those viral proteins be detected? Why, of course, they would be packaged into class 1 MHC receptors and pushed out to the plasma membrane. And then, and only then, would it be able to interact with naive killer T cells and possibly activate them. So what are the steps required for naive killer T cell activation? Actually, they're remarkably similar from what we know to what happens with helper T cells. Now, I must state that the activation of naive killer T cells uh, our understanding of it is still a little bit hazy. We don't have all the details. The one thing we can say with high degree of confidence is that it's going to require, at a minimum, the four things that, that helper T cells are going to require. It's going to require the um, recognition of its cognate antigen by its specialized T cell receptor. It's also going to need confirmation that the information is coming from the right source. Small little tweak. That small little tweak is simply that instead of a CD4 receptor on the surface of the helper T cell interacting with an MHC2 on the APC, it's actually going to be the CD8 receptor on the surface of the killer T cell interacting with material in the MHC1 receptor on the antigen presenting cell. Subtle tweak there.
you're still going to need that that immunological synapse form. You're still going to need lots of that material there. And you're also going to need host stimulation uh, with the uh, B7 protein and the CD28 receptor. We know that that is sufficient to get at least a minor response out of killer T cell. The other thing we know is that if we're going to have a persistent killer T cell response, and if we're going to form those central memory T cells uh, that we'd like to have, it's going to require the aid of activated helper T cells. Now, the question about how they do this and how you end up getting helper T cells and killer T cells activated at the exact same time in the, in the exact same place um, is still a bit murky. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how helper T cells do aid in this process. We know that it happens, we just don't know all the details. The good news is, is regardless of, uh, of whether this is a bacterial infection or a, or a viral infection, that dendritic cell its presence in the, lymph in the lymph nodes and the lymphatic system is going to be a very important step in activating the third line of defense, our adaptive immune system, which is going to be necessary to fight off any sort of prolonged or large infection. Now, the one thing we haven't talked about is what are these cells going to do once they're activated? The activation of specific helper T cells and specific killer T cells is a process known as clonal selection. Once those cells have been selected, we refer to them as clones because once they begin to multiply, they make clones of themselves, identical versions of themselves. Once we've selected those T cell clones to be activated, they're going to undergo a process called clonal expansion, which is where they make thousands of identical copies of themselves. After this, what happens with those cells and how do they work? Furthermore, we've yet to talk about the B cell branch of adaptive immunity. How do B cells get activated? And how do they operate to help confer immunity upon our body? We'll talk about all that and more in our next video in the adaptive immune system. Thank you so much again for tuning in today. Uh, this was our fourth video on the immune system. We talked about antigen presentation, which is the process of the innate immune system interacting with and activating the adaptive immune system in the case of an infection. We're going to continue our conversation in our next video, which will be video five, where we talk about the adaptive immune response and how that helps to keep us alive. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you're learning a lot through this whole series, and I will talk to you again real soon.